this right idea. So I want me to talk a little bit about test equipment. And the club had acquired a, piece, a couple pieces of equipment, the system on the counter, counter and the scope. And uh, we're going to kind of base this around these uh, things that were donated to the club. First of all, if you need a piece of test equipment, what is the one basic piece of test equipment you should have in your toolbox? Scope. <laughs> Okay, you're right. We're taking bolt only. It's actually bolt only milliamp meter, believe it or not. And we have BTBMs. So back in the old days, when I was starting out, right? You're right. There were two. There was a VOM, and the problem with VOMs is they had so many ohms per volt. They were passive. They had nice, expensive top band meter that could cost $200 even for the high-end Simpsons, right? And, but they had a rating called ohm per volt. And the good ones were like 20,000 ohms per volt. And what did that mean? Well, if you put it on the three volt scale, it meant you were shunning, your measurement was a 60,000 ohms worth of resistance. So if you're measuring a high impedance circuit, uh, Obviously, your measurement equipment would have a rather large impact on what you're measuring. To get around that, we had the VTVM, which was a vacuum tube voltmeter that had a very high input impedance, like a meg ohm, to try to avoid. So we had, in the old days, we had to have two different meters, one for high impedance circuits, or VTVM, that had vacuum tubes and drove the meter, and then the cheap, nice, passive VOM, right? Well, now we got these, right? Yep. You buy one for five or six bucks, ten bucks, whatever, off eBay. Um, they have transistors in them and the IRICs. They, uh, therefore, they have a high input impedance, like the VTVM. You know, they run on a nine volt battery, and they'll do things like text, test transistors. They'll take diodes. Some of them have capacitor meters. Some of them have frequency counters built into them, right? So, the number one thing you should always have is one of these. You can or pay more. or more. Oh, yeah. So you can pay a hundred dollars for a good precision one. You can go buy yourself a nice fluke, or you can buy one of these things off Harbor Freight or wherever. Right? You get it free with a coupon. In or free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's <a cereal>. So <laughs> that's number one. So number two, outside the antenna analyzers for, for trying to cut your antenna to, so the, feed, so the transfer thinks it's seeing 50 ohms. Um, other than that, what's the next piece of test equipment that you should invest in? Telescope. You're right. One of these. And when I was, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old, you know, I went out and I bought a, had a heat kit, bought us an oscilloscope. Because you can see on this display the signals, and you can troubleshoot radios with them. If your receiver needs alignment, you can use the scope to measure the levels of the signals at the IF and the RF that you do to do your alignment. Um, troubleshooting radios, a transmitter. Back in my college days, we had a thousand watt FM station, campus station. And I remember just before Thanksgiving, um, we lost drive. And it was a Collins. And I was like, okay, let's go through there. It was in the exciter deck. Obviously, it wasn't final, which was a 4, 6, 1,000. So um, I got tasked going in there to figure out what was wrong with it. And so I borrowed an oscilloscope, 100 or 90 megahertz oscilloscope, 100 meg scope from the physics department. Because the EE department only had scopes that were good to 10 megahertz, and that wouldn't work for it if I brought it. So I go off, and what was it? I found it. A coupling capacitor between the a driver and the, the IPA and, and the exciter had opened up. It's like, here's the signal, other side of the capacitor, no signal. Voltages are good. Um, so the scope let me find where I lost the signal. 
And in this case, it was a bad capacitor. They, they not, not broadcast transfer over here. And that reminds me of one more thing wrong with something come about these guys. If you go back and like Dennis buy old radios and go pull up the schematics and the tech manual, you're gonna find pretty universally all the manuals are gonna have a chart in them with the tube sockets. And they're gonna tell you how much voltage and how many ohms to ground should be at each tube socket. So you can troubleshoot your old radios that way. And so that's another reason <laughs> these are really handy to have. Okay, so the scope really is the best thing. So the third thing is an age should be what? A signal generator. So you can test stuff. You can generate your signals, inject it in the receiver, you can align your IF. And it doesn't have to be really fancy. You can spend two thousand dollars for a nice used HP or Agilent, or you can find this heat kit thing for ten dollars. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, uh, and this one does work. I checked it with my actual working scope, and um, at, before I brought it, I did have to spray from deoxid on the switches because they were a little bit funky. But okay. And then, but the problem is these things are not too accurate. You know, you just kind of the dial there, so you won't be right on 455. Hence, we have the frequency counter. It's a very handy accessory. This is a 19, late 1960s vintage, Cistron Donner, that the club was donated. We turned it on one time, and all the Nixie tubes lit up. And tonight we're finding out for the first time that it's not really counting. <laughs> so it definitely has something wrong with it. Um, I know my signal is coming out. I can just put the signal on the oscilloscope. So it's there. So, um, but even with an inexpensive signal generator, if you have a counter. Now, back in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, we, we came out with the nice TTL logic chips like the 7490 counter chip. And all of a sudden, in the late 70s, frequency counters really became very cheap and common. Because you know, there was really nice ICs you could build them with. And then we progressed to larger scaling and greater circuits. So this is what we have today. <laughs> this is from the, the 1990s. This is a 10 hertz to 3 gig a hertz frequency counter. It, you know, in, in its day, even was about $100. And you could, again, could buy these today probably on eBay for, I don't know, $40 or $50 to go up in the higher frequencies. For low frequencies, you can probably find a meter that has a frequency counter in it that will count up to at least a megahertz. So this thing, this box here is nice digital LCD display and all. And I forgot to put new batteries in it because I didn't have time. But <clears throat> basically, it does the same as this, except this one does go for the 500 megs, which is pretty good for the 1960s. Um, what batteries does it use? I have to open it up to find out because I don't remember. I have got, I, expect a I have like three <laughs> counters oh, around on my bench. Um, it's kind of weird because it's. Part of it's floating around loose inside a little bit. <laughs> that may be just the battery clip. Too. Yeah. If you have no battery in there. Well, it also has a. Uh, yeah. The cap. I thought. It, you know. Actually, it's a, it's a nine volt, nine to twelve volts input here. So sometimes I use it with the, just an adapter. But this basically replaces this. But again. The, the, the neat thing about them of hanging them handy is it allows you to set this thing right to 455 and so you can go through there and pick your IF cans in your national NC193 or your uh, HRO60 or whatever uh, old receiver you're trying to repair. So I think, you know, again, we're... Uh, oh, so unfortunately, it looks like this is not working. So that was the part of this was to get a demo on, on this. We have a troubleshooting clinic right here. Right. Um, <laughs> Which you can use the scope to well, count. The scope has another issue itself too. Yeah. That's also was a donation. It's owned by the club. And so I'm gonna go ahead and plug that in. 
I think we know why they were donations now. Yeah, we know why they were donations. So this, this guy has the amplitude's good, frequency response is there, but it's not triggering properly. So if it, well, I can change the height, it's easy. <laughs> But I can move the horizontal position as well. But the problem is, it's not really triggering like it should be. Or it's triggering everything. Well, it should be syncing up in, in, in normal mode. Um, it looked like it was for a moment. Yeah, so it's supposed to be a triggered sweep scope. So, one of the other things we'll talk real quick about scopes. Ah, there we go. There. Hey. There. Okay, so there's our there's our signal generator with with the nice and you can see how the nice sinusoidal waveform it is. With a little oscillation on it. Yeah, we saw it playing the earth. Yeah, I turn it up and you can see the, the A in there at least. So 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 you know if you had an amplifier you were testing and it was distorting, you put your test signal in and you could see the distortion on the oscilloscope. And as I said, for peaking, you know, they used to say connect a VTVM to go to this test point and measure levels. I just use a scope. First of all, it's hard today to peak things back and forth to try to peak a circuit to maximum response. Especially three fractions every second. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, uh, is that the digital one that you the huh? freight one? Uh, is that as good as like a heat kit VTVM? I'm sorry, it was what? Is, is it as good as, you know, beam slides and all that? It's a question of, of you know, stability, accuracy, you know. What you pay for it. You get what you pay for. Yeah, but like the old Heath Kid BTVM, you can get those for like 15, 20 bucks anymore on eBay. Yeah, well, you, you can buy these for I know, but is it, which would be which is better, is my question. <laughs> Both. Well, I don't have the, you know, finding the specs on these things is rather hard to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most of them do have a high input impedance because they, they generally run into an IC that does the, the voltage to frequency conversion, which is a high impedance circuit. So generally, they actually don't load the circuit you're measuring. Uh, accuracy, eh. But again, the heat kit BTVM, if you want to align your receiver, it's pretty hard to watch those digits to yeah. peak those coils as you're tuning the slugs, right? So that's why you want that old BTVM still on your, your test shelf. Uh, or if you happen to have a fluke uh, multi digital multimeter, it often has a bar graph. Well, they have a bar graph too, but again, you're trying to get a peak. I mean, you're looking at, you know, it, peaking, it, not, not watching it, anything it, digital. It's better at least than trying to do it from the digits. Right, but it doesn't beat a good old-fashioned the Arsenal hot band meter. Okay, so again, um, this scope's kind of interesting. I have a, it, it also has a digital capability built into it, so at lower frequencies, it's supposed to be able to to um, capture and store a trace. Um, and I could not find a manual for this one anywhere online. I tried. Like at all. So, who made the scope? This is a Hitachi. Okay. Lee, I, I see um, there was an article uh, not long ago in QST where they were talking about um, oscilloscopes that um, they they connect to your right. computer by USB. Right. Well, again, they, they have what, basically. What are they doing? They're sampling, coming into digital, and feeding it into a USB interface. So. Um, the problem is a lot of the ones that are inexpensive that you buy, the bandwidth is only a couple megahertz. And the other thing is we're seeing here, which kind of goes back to my old Heath kit scopes, is the, you got to sync up. These are trigger sweep, which was something Tektronix invented back in the 40s, late 1940s. So that the waveform is constantly displayed, right? It triggers, it actually starts to sweep, it's triggered off the voltage point on the input waveform. Right. Or whatever you want. But my old Heath kit that I built, it wasn't a trigger sweep scope. So you'd have to adjust the frequency of the scope, right? So it just matched the, to just match the, the signal so it would sync up the signal. 
and that was the old fashioned Six. standard <laughs> 1960s, you know, teeth kit, whatever. Uh, the triggered sweet scopes made by Tektronix at the time, the old 500s, yeah, they were hundreds of dollars. Now you can go find them on trash piles, but nonetheless. So, um, if, if you can lift them. <laughs> if you can lift them. Okay, so. Um, so just to finish up, you don't think a lot of these ones that you would... The problem is there are good ones, but they're very expensive. And the thing you have to look, to look at is the sampling speed and the bandwidth. This is a 50 megahertz scope. That's one thing I would recommend. For us working at RF, I would recommend that you get at least a 50, if not a 100 or 300 megahertz scope. And there are digital scopes today that um, you can buy for a couple hundred dollars, five, well, three or four, five hundred dollars, whatever. They're pretty good scopes. Um, the Rigel digital scopes, for example. And then you have digital traces, you can download them to your computer and, <coughs> as opposed to the analog. But again, they have very high speed A to D converters. Um, and you have to have enough bits to get decent resolution, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that tends to drive the price up. Yeah. So the, the, the $39, $49 scope board from China, you know, it might be an 8 bit, which doesn't give you a whole lot of measurement dynamic range. And the other problem is the sampling rate. Um, you know, typically, you would like to sample multiple times your highest frequency. So, for realistically, if, if you're doing RF type work, you want a scope that gets sampled up to like a giga sample per second, roughly, to give you enough bandwidth so you can even look at maybe two meters to troubleshoot your two meter radio. And I've done that with the with the 300 meg scope. So that's that's the other thing. So anybody had any other? So this guy's a little bit flaky, as you can see, but it, it does work. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to do something. Work, look at that thing. Where it's make, I'm not sure Thor exactly what the club's going to do with them, but but this and that uh, belong to the club at this point. So anybody else? Any other questions? This is a short, sweet one. Thank you.